Welcome back to Car Drive. If you just joined us, well, you're a bit late, but you're also in time because uh, we're about to start our conversation with our guest, Dr. Zoelim Kize, in the studio. Uh, before we went to ad break, we spoke about how, I suppose prior to this, uh, you hadn't really been present, uh, whereas we got used to seeing you every day during mm-hmm. COVID. Uh, there's obviously a reason for that, and we'll get to that reason. Uh, but I guess imminently right now, you have taken the decision that you're going to contest uh, at the ANC elective conference uh, for presidency. Maybe let's start with that. What led to that decision? Two things, uh, Caesar. <clears throat> and let me say again, uh, greetings to all the listeners. Mm. Uh, in the first instance, uh, the members of the ANC approached me to make myself available. And uh, so that becomes an important issue that uh, you don't just stand, but people ask you. Then secondly was, uh, I felt that uh, uh, personally I have a contribution to make. Uh, I have worked uh, as a leader of the ANC at all levels, literally no level I've skipped. Mm. And uh, one of the things that I believe I can contribute in is effective leadership of the African National Congress, building unity uh, so that you've got an effective organization. The second issue <clears throat> relates to the fact that uh, I have actually led government at different level, and my reputation has been that of uh, clean government, uh, fighting corruption, and uh, implementation, and therefore really results driven. So I felt what I would do is just to say, let's look at what policies are there and uh, implement what can be implemented and see uh, how much change we can make because there's been an outcry about poor implementation of policies. So on that basis, I've actually had a leadership style which is a hands-on approach basically making a difference wherever i participate in the leadership so we'll get to your track record uh, because indeed you are with us for the entire afternoon but if you speak about the organization right now uh, and in fact in your video when you are addressing uh, Amak Labane, you spoke of Amak Labane, ka John Langalibalele Dube. you spoke of Amak Labane, ka Oliver Reginald Tambo if those two individuals, including Mandela, because you also cited him as well, were alive, do you think Ukongolose, uh, one would be Ukongolose uh, that they had in mind during the formation? Um, I think there are a lot of <clears throat> weaknesses that have crept into the ANC as of today. Uh, and certainly uh, part of it has got to do with the environment and the, uh, the space in which we are. But certainly part of it has also got to do with the kind of leadership that we're providing. So when I raised that issue, I was basically uh, giving it as a critique of the leadership that I'm part of. Mm. I think that um, with the things that are going on, if somebody were to ask me the question, uh, what do you think uh, needs to be done differently? I would then say, we need to focus on implementation of those policies that uh, were designed to change the lives of South Africans so that we can improve them. Uh, and therefore, I wouldn't contribute on that, at that level. But also, uh, the ANC that's got a huge gap between itself and the people, so that uh, 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 you know people feel it doesn't represent them and so many of them don't vote, we need to correct that and make sure that the day-to-day posture of the ANC leadership and membership must reflect the concerns of the people on the ground and close that gap because the ANC without people would not really have existed. And the ANC existed to serve the interest of the people. So that would, for me, have been the uh, issues that I believe are important to deal with. And to effectively deal with those, you need a united a leadership that can sit together, discuss issues together, and not project an impression that... Uh, you know, uh, people are out there fighting each other, <clears throat> but that they are united so that they can better serve our communities. And so then the question would be, because after 28 uh, years of leadership uh, on the ANC side, mm. I would like to believe that the leadership was always aware what the people of South Africa needed. Uh, I'd also like to believe, especially the policies, some of them go back as far as uh, the Freedom Charter, uh, so the policies have not changed much. There have been tweaks here and there in every conference, but uh, I think the NC policies speak for themselves. The implementation, however, as you put it, has always left a lot to be desired. Uh, 
And it would seem, uh, and I know some of the listeners will say this as well, um, that whenever it is time to go to election, the ANC then speaks a good game. Uh, and then when it's time to deliver in between those elections, we see nothing different. Look, I think we, we need to just consider two issues. Firstly, that uh, the, the uh, challenges are huge, and so they would not have been resolved within a short space of time. Where Many years back, uh, if I can just give you an example, um, uh, when I led the province of Kwazulu Natal, uh, we did a calculation at the rate at which uh, the housings, uh, housing uh, department was delivering. Uh, the last person who would have been homeless in 1994 would have had to wait until 2038 uh, based on what was available. <clears throat> now, that means that there are objectively challenges in uh, you know, matching the needs together with the resources. So mm -hmm. that's one of the problems. And the second aspect is that uh, there are a, a lot of things that have happened, you know, that uh, over the years have happened. And we have been criticizing the ANC for areas where we think it's not done, you know, well enough, uh, where we think that uh, the service delivery has lagged behind, uh, where we think that, uh, you know, some of the people just haven't done what was supposed to be done. In the past few years, uh, the challenges that have been raised that relate to, uh, you know, government operation, and even if you were to sit with some of those who are leading government, was uh, the this refrain that uh, uh, there is no delivery. And I'm then saying to uh, our people, we have good policies, but we need then to say the leadership who are there must actually focus on delivery. And therefore, I made my, myself available on the basis that's what, that's what I want to focus on. Now, if you look as well <clears throat> on the, let's just take example of uh, uh, the unemployment. Unemployment was high, about 33% in 1994. It came down. Uh, by 2018, it was down to about 23%. It has shot up again to about 35%, which is huge. Completely unacceptable, particularly if you consider that mostly it's the young people who are affected by that. And uh, my point would be uh, there's a lot more that we should be doing to try and deal with that. And I'm saying I won't answer that question from the touchlines. I won't be talking from outside. If I'm given the chance, let me be judged on the basis of how much we can impact on those issues. Okay. <clears throat> but you said when you began, for example, that you've led in every structure and every level of the ANC. Correct. You've been a, a part of the top six. Uh, you are part of the NEC, which is the highest decision-making body in the <clears throat> ANC in between uh, conferences. But you never see that kind of cohesive leadership in the ANC. So I'll give you an example. Whenever there is a new regime or a new head of executive, right, uh, it seems like that person comes with their own policies and priorities. And then whenever there's a change, it seems that there's a purge that changes and there's literally no continuity at all. You'd expect an organization which is as cohesive <coughs> and led as you describe to have a 30, 60, 90 year plan that regardless of whom the leader is, gets carried out. Absolutely correct. Uh, we do need that. And uh, there has to be a very long term view that we take of the country. Uh, the five year term is about the administration in office. And then we need to look beyond that because that temptation has been there certainly of people who come in and they want to uh, devise what might be their own pet projects or their policies. These are weaknesses that we have to correct. Uh, but <clears throat> if you look at uh, uh, the leadership, uh, there's, there's what you can do collectively and there's a limit to what we can do collectively and take responsibility for, uh, particularly when it comes to issues of policies and issues of monitoring. But uh, there are, there's another aspect which becomes important. The skills of the leaders involved, if the leader in, uh, who's, who's leading, the skills of, the, of, of that leader are important. The leadership style is also important. Now, I think that's where you'll see a lot of difference in terms of... Um, if you look across, it's the same part in different provinces, but the performance is also going to depend on how well each leader understands the challenges in front of them uh, and how well each leader understands the strengths and the weaknesses of the people that are part of the team and how well such a leader is able to 
call together and merge those skills to an effective machinery. Now, my approach would have been that uh, a very <clears throat> uh, strong team leader, I believe in teams. I also believe in new energies. That's why the issue of getting younger people to be involved becomes important. And the nice thing about young people is that they, have, they owe nobody any loyalty. So they ask any question and they can actually be very disruptive in a, in a, in a way so that you, you rethink whatever you have to do. Now, with that, you also need a confident leader who does not feel intimidated by different views but can learn from what others have to say and this is certainly how uh, i have been uh, you know uh, involved in leadership and so i think the skill to unite people so that even if they are not friends but you can actually get them to operate as one unit to deliver what is needed and keep the focus that certainly is what i think i want to contribute and so even within the contestation <clears throat> of power uh, when, for example, we headed towards an elective conference, when people uh, are running for either regional leadership or national leadership, how it gets done also leaves a lot to be desired. Because to the point where then all of a sudden after conference, people expect everybody else to look at the party with respect. When all along for the last maybe two and a half years, <laughs> things have been getting revealed and we can't respect anybody within the party. Does the party never realize, Uti, this makes us lose confidence in the party as a whole? Look, I think, again, you are correct there. The internal democracy can be messy, uh, but it's something that develops with time, how you manage to rein in uh, some of the negative approaches that people use because they're now contesting. <clears throat> Uh, the approach from the ANC has been very much to say, let's try and focus on what will build the party and what will build society. But uh, people have got extremities, and uh, as, a as a result, we've actually been asking that we need more rules to regulate the election process. I think we're far from what we need to be, we're far from where we should have been. I, I way back around 2005, was a uh, uh, a guest of the Chama Chama Pinduzi in uh, Tanzania. After about 30 years or 40 years uh, in, of, in, uh, in, in government, <clears throat> they realized the need to regulate uh, party con internal contestation. We took those lessons because we're now seeing exactly what you're saying, where people are, uh, and so on. And what I think also becomes important is how we need to always make sure that people who get into this understand what it is all about. Because if it is all about serving society, serving the needs of the people, that should be more the focus rather than trying to destroy everything just so that you can get yourself into the position. Unfortunately, that still happens, and uh, we have a long way towards dealing with that. It's not only at that level. Even as you go to the local government elections mainly, uh, where people are dealing at a very close local level, you find that those problems are still there. I think it's something that needs to be dealt with over a period because it can be very uninspiring for society to see the people who have been throwing mud at each other <clears throat> then turn around and say, we're actually very good friends and therefore, and that's what has to happen. Now, my approach is what discussing here. I'm actually very conscious of the fact that uh, if I raise criticism, I'm not raising criticism outside. I'm saying this is what we've been doing and these are the things that we've done wrong and we have to criticize ourselves and therefore this is what I think I can contribute in correcting those. We're joined in studio by Dr. Zoelim Kize. Uh, he's going to be with us for the duration of the show. If you've got any questions, please give us a shout, 86 You can send us your voice notes as well, 63 When we come back after news, I want to get into your career now as a politician. Uh, and I'm sure you'll agree you've had your peaks and troughs, you've had your ups and downs, and I want to just concentrate on that for the next hour. Bob Marley and the Whalers. Could you be loved on 959 is car drive. We're on the streets, we're on the air, we're everywhere. Uh, I know Bob Marley is one of your favorites. <laughs> uh, and so before in the last hour when we were speaking, we obviously touched on the ANC as an organization um, and we promised that we'd come back and in this hour we'd speak about your career. If you're wondering who I'm talking about, we join in studio by Dr. Zuelim Kiza. If you've got any questions, you can give us a shout, 86 So let's say maybe 2021, uh, 20, the whole year during COVID, 
uh, a lot of people seem to have been very pleased with how you led us uh, uh, as uh, as a minister of health. They had a lot of faith in you, uh, and at some point, I even saw, for example, headlines on Financial Mail, Newsmaker of the Year, uh, all around. Uh, even I think globally, people revered how you and the president uh, basically handled COVID for us as a country. Then digital vibes happened. Uh, and there was disappointment across the board. Um, people couldn't believe what had happened, much less to get during a time where we needed all the funds that we could get because we were fighting a global pandemic. Uh, and I'm sure you can understand that. Even now, that disappointment, whenever you raise the name Dr. Zelinki, it does persist. Uh, so maybe let's talk about that. Uh, and what your views are. Before we even get to the SIU investigation, surely you realize that had it not been for that part of your career, um, you could even say your trail now to leadership would be uncontested, perhaps. Well, uh, maybe it would have been so, but I think you're raising a very important point uh, about Mm. this uh, Digital Vibes investigation. Uh, I think also personally uh, it's been a very disappointing situation that I'm not proud of at all. Mm. And I also would say I've understood people who have been angry, those who have been disappointed and those who have become skeptical uh, because <clears throat> we were in the middle of a very difficult uh, challenge that the country faced and then certainly uh, you know, everyone would have expected that uh, our focus should not be diverted by some such things as what has happened. And so from that point of view, uh, one has looked back and feel, and that's why, in fact, uh, in the middle of it, uh, I actually did uh, issue an apology to the public that as much as uh, the way it had happened, uh, I had not uh, uh, done anything wrong uh, on my side, but uh, I did understand why people were upset and why uh, people were disappointed. And I issued an apology at that level. But maybe it would be important just to briefly just go through that so that we can also say, because I think it also has got lots of lessons that we have to deal with. And and certainly uh, I would understand people who are feeling uh, that they are still negative around that matter. Uh, But I also believe uh, that everything that needed to have been done on this matter has been done to uh, get it to be um, investigated and addressed in the manner that all issues and allegations should be. Well, as a public, we don't feel that way because as a public, we still don't have definitive answers as to what happened, right? So we've read the SIU mm-hmm. report. The SIU report points to 150 million rand in total uh, that was awarded to Digital Vibes. Uh, it then happened that the directors and owners of the company, uh, the Mather family, had links to you specifically. Uh, as an individual. Some of the beneficiaries also from Digital Vibes happen to be a family member in the name of Udedani. Uh, and then I, your direct benefit, I think, was about 7,000 rand in terms of direct payments that the SIU and the investigation was able to link directly to you. And then through other various subsidiaries, uh, they estimated about maybe 2.5 million that went through different channels that they say went that to a family member of your own as well. So maybe before we get to the details, um, let's just speak about the optics of it all. It would be highly coincidental that a department that you were at the head of uh, then awarded the contract to people that you also knew. Would you agree? The, that would, in terms of its optics, could be a, a problem. And that's why I say one has a, a lot of lessons to learn out of it. Mm. Uh, the reality, though, is that... Uh, uh, the process of award uh, had nothing to do with me and therefore uh, I was happy that it was investigated and it has gone to a point where the uh, officials who were involved in the award of the contract were actually uh, asked and the SIU was the one that gave uh, all the evidence and they could uh, uh, not actually confirm any fraud. They actually uh, found the members to be guilty of negligence, uh, the miscalculation of the contract. And in that process, there was not once 
anything to suggest that there was ministerial or executive involvement, which is a point that I'd made about it. Although I knew the lady who was involved at the time, uh, she uh, had worked with me before, but I actually didn't know the relationship with the company, but I knew her. But in the process, I had not played a role in the award of the contract. And I think that uh, as a fact is the case. But of course, the optics are always like, oh, but why, why should it almost look uh, like you had done something about it? Mm. So to clear that, you have to then allow a full process of investigation to deal with that matter. And in my case, uh, it has done, it has done uh, that and explained that the people who were involved were actually given uh, sentences uh, or penalties of uh, reduction of salaries, mainly on the basis of the fact that this is a serious matter, although ultimately um, they've not been charged with crime or fraud or anything like that. And so then what about the Daniel Keyes' involvement? Because yes. him, he was directly implicated and directly a beneficiary. Yes. The, there are two issues that uh, uh, related then to, to Tedani. One was the fact that one of the people who was uh, involved in the company had actually uh, gifted money to Tedani, and that money was a, an arrangement with, between them that had to do with really more uh, their relationship or friendship, if one may say so. And therefore, that uh, did not have anything to do with the contract pay se. And uh, that's why I then said uh, that uh, money needed to be paid back uh, so that <clears throat> whatever investigation, we, we avoid that kind of association. In fact, in the process of all of that, uh, I also was taken up because the matter was re re reported by the newspaper and uh, I actually asked for leave to go and investigate. And, and as I went to it, I then found that uh, it was indeed true, but that uh, the role of the Dani the, the, in the process of the uh, uh, contract, this uh, Digital Vibes contract, he was not part of the contract, he was not part of the uh, company, he was not a subcontractor of the company, he was just associated with the one individual. So that was the one aspect. But uh, in the process, because of the people being related or linking somewhere else, uh, some of the issues that got involved had to do with transactions because one of the fellows who was, uh, was uh, doing a business there wanted to do work uh, in the farm and also was involved uh, in the purchase of animals. And so, you know, that process is what created the very ne wide network at that level. Uh, that, uh, as far as we would also be aware, was not all linked to the contract uh, as it was originally given. So it, it just becomes one of those things that one learns lessons to say, must always, uh, you know, be uh, vigilant, ask questions, and also discourage, even if it is not directly linked, but if it would create an impression, then you need to actually avoid that. So that, for me, is uh, one of the major lessons out of the process. Then the other aspects <clears throat> related to uh, something to do with um, uh, money that went into a house. Now, again, that was explained because the um, uh, the uh, a staff member who was involved was actually linked to uh, a, fr in a friendship with some of the people who worked in the company. Now, those two matters that relate to my son in the house were actually taken to Parliament, and Parliament asked me to give all the answers about it. And this was the Ethics Committee. The same answers that I'd given to the um, SIU were actually viewed, reviewed by the Parliamentary Ethics Committee. And it cleared me on that and did say that this matter is closed because the people who were involved, they could track that there was a relationship uh, amongst them and that that issue didn't have anything to do with me. So as far as I would be concerned, that part was closed by that investigation. But what is important is that uh, I did subject myself to that process of investigation by parliament and had the results been otherwise, I would have had to take responsibility and resign from parliament. But the fact that it was clear, it meant I actually can continue working in parliament. So it becomes one of those lessons that one can look back and say, 
going forward in the future, I must always watch out for these kinds of things. But if it had not been cleared by Parliament, then of course I would have had to get out. So I think it's important when people are criticizing us, we must also acknowledge that there's a reason why we would get criticized. I also acknowledge that there has to be a lot of accountability. People must look at us and not take anything for granted, ask questions. And if that happens, we can't object. We need to know that is the nature of our environment that people must hold us accountable and i've accepted that so there will be those who will understand the explanation there will be those who will still feel very uneasy about it and very uncomfortable but my view is that i have learned lessons out of it and going forward uh, i also want to make sure that uh, we can deal with those issues so that they, they don't recur so the context is also pretty important and when we come back i want to delve deeper into that context uh, we join the studio by dr zuelim kize uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to shoot them our way. 86 0 You can give us a call or you can send us a WhatsApp voice note on 63 Welcome back to Car Drive. You just joined us. We are joined in the studio by Dr. Zuelim Keys as a guest. If you've got any questions, you can send them through 86 0 or send us a voice note on 63 before we went to uh, the traffic and then went to an ad break, Dr. Mkiza, you were speaking about digital vibes uh, and I said well the context is also pretty important uh, even though there has been an SIU report that was written uh, you have also presented yourself to the parliamentary committee ethics committee uh, and they found that there was no evidence directly linking you to that in our country especially with our history uh, we just literally completed um, a state capture inquiry where a lot of people came forward. And as part of the evidence, we heard of certain individuals who were trading their proximity to power for their own benefit. Uh, again, there hasn't been much tangible evidence there, and there's been no prosecutions thus far. But I think we can all surmise that the state was captured and indeed there was corruption in some of those relationships. When you then look at the country within that respect, uh, and it's even happened with Bosasa, for example, including our current president, also happened to be his son, who received 500,000 rand and benefited from that. Do you then not see why South Africans would be concerned, especially if you're running for uh, now president of the ANC, which would ultimately mean that you could be president of the country, that would be an even more responsibility given to you, even more power that you'd have as the head of the executive. Uh, and so then if people around you could then benefit without your knowledge, what is stopping you or, or stopping them from benefiting in the future? Well, I think, as I've said, the main issue is just to be more vigilant in such circumstances. Uh, although uh, I've been uh, in the public uh, administration <clears throat> for almost 20 years, uh, over that period, we have never really had this kind of thing. So now that I've uh, seen such a, an example of a, a challenge that uh, gives very difficult optics, then I think that it's something that we must just be aware that every now and again we must be you know, watching how to prevent that. But there are certain issues that may be difficult to even um, <clears throat> deal with. If uh, people th that come to look for contracts in the department are people that you know, it's easier if you are involved directly. Then you can declare the interest, you can actually recuse yourself, you can say, I, I know so and so, and so on. But there are many times where I had sitting in that department, uh, I had to sign <clears throat> the appointment of somebody and as I look at them, uh, somebody was involved in the process of uh, uh, appointing them. They were involved in the, uh, uh, you know, uh, issuing of the uh, uh, contract. They were involved in the appointment, uh, appointing them as a board. Uh, as long as the process is proper, then I have to actually authorize it. But in instances where we were to employ people, I found many people were my colleagues that I had known before, uh, but they needed to be employed and the employment had nothing to do with the fact that I knew them, then I would declare uh, you know, uh, interest and say uh, I know this particular person and to this point and uh, they must also declare. So in this case <clears throat> the declaration uh, does not become easy to do if 
uh, the process is happening in a different part of the administration, especially because uh, as a minister, you're not allowed to sit in the procurement process to vet people who get uh, involved in the procurement. So the only time you will know is when the name, uh, the individual has come up that this is the person uh, that would have been appointed. Sometimes you know the you know the person, but you don't know the company. So those issues will always arise. And I think what's important is that as soon as something goes wrong, you have to deal with it. Now, in this case, for example, the matter was uh, flagged by the Auditor General, uh, and uh, I had no clue what uh, that anything had gone wrong there. <clears throat> then uh, I then had to uh, ask the Director General to investigate using an external independent forensic auditor and uh, also look into the way that the thing was uh, pro was um, um, the, the the contract was uh, awarded uh, awarded yes now they did this investigation and somewhere along the line the SIU became interested and then uh, I said to them we'll offer them a full cooperation the report was uh, it came up it didn't show anything about fraud it actually showed uh, you know negligence it showed uh, uh, the uh, calculation and overcharging uh, that was part of it. So we then went ahead to say they will, will discipline the individuals, and then we went ahead to say we shall retrieve the money that um, had been, uh, you know, uh, spent on them. But the SIU then uh, uh, suddenly then said <clears throat> they would wanted to, they wanted to do that. We must hand over the report, and that's how I handed over the report to the SIU. Uh, in that process as well. I was keeping the president very well informed about it. And I think it's important for me to say uh, the president had to be informed and uh, I had to cooperate with the processes of the SIU. Uh, then uh, when the name of my family, my son, was, was raised, I then said I'll stay out of the investigation to make sure there's objectivity. And that, again, I think is a responsible approach to dealing with it. Uh, when I was then invited to, uh, be, to be interviewed by the SIU, I then realized that their approach was problematic. They were not taking the evidence that we're submitting to them. They seem to have already preconceived ideas and they approached this uh, uh, you know, investigation with a fixed mind of finding me guilty anyway. <clears throat> then I raised the matter to the president. So when the uh, evidence was given, uh, they just simply just sent the, the report to the president. The same uh, evidence that clear, cleared me in parliament was actually given to the SIU and they never really acknowledged it. So as we sit now, that matter uh, that was uh, involving the family was cleared in parliament. The issue of uh, uh, where they made a, a, an allegation that I pressurized the staff, that issue was actually dealt with in the internal uh, disciplinary process and no evidence whatsoever. Uh, again, now my name never even featured in that and the SIU was giving the evidence. The last one, the uh, SIU said I had done, uh, I had uh, breached a resolution of cabinet by appointing a committee, a, 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 a contractor, a private company to do the communication. Now, Department of Health has been doing that over the years and there's nothing new there. But then I said to SIU, give me the resolution. They don't have it. And then <clears throat> I knew they didn't have it. Initially, they said, well, it's, it's classified. I said, no, the president can declassify it for you. Then they had to openly admit that they actually don't have such a resolution. Now, how on earth do you accuse someone of breaking a resolution when you don't have it? So that, again, I told them it was a lie. I knew it was not uh, uh, the, the, such a resolution didn't, uh, didn't exist. So all of those three instances and the reason why is I actually said the court must set it aside. So I think out of all of that, when a, any member of the executive gets an, a, a complaint, you have to ensure that the in, it's investigated, it is objectively investigated. When the <clears throat> when you uh, have uh, the reports coming back, you need to implement the, 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 the recommendations and make sure that there is a, a due process that gets followed. And in this case, it was done. When uh, there were issues where there was a direct accusation for me, I said to the president, I'm going to resign so that I can deal with this matter. I also don't want to deal with a matter that's personal using government resources. So that's why I resigned. And I said, I'm going to cite the president because he was the one who was appointed the SIU. So again, 
I believe all of these issues are steps that a rep responsible leader must do. And that's what I have done. And so if in future myself or any other members have to face accusation, we must accept that uh, we have to be investigated. And again, I will still face investigation if there's any other future allegations. And if there's an allegation that involves, it doesn't matter whether it's about family or people that you're close to, you must allow the investigative process to go through. So I think that I've done everything that a responsible leader should do. And of course, I said I've learned lessons. We join in studio by Dr. Zulim Kize. And we are taking all your questions, all of your calls, 86 0959 You can hit us up and send us a voice note as well on 0636-880959. Dr. Mkize, have you heard of the term Mr. 10%? Uh, I've, I've heard it from one uh, reporter, one presenter. Mm. I think it was J.J. Taban. Yes. Yes. Uh, he had taken it from uh, President Tawombegi, actually. Although President Tawombegi did not mention your name specifically. Uh, and then there was obviously some narrative that permeated that ever since you have been in leadership, even in KZN, uh, if there's a contract that gets awarded... Uh, you require a stake in such. <clears throat> uh, I suppose it didn't help that you were also the Treasurer General of the ANC at some point. Uh, and <laughs> when you are that person, money then flows through you. Uh, so what is your response to something like that? Well, firstly, it's a lie. Mm. It's a lie. And I would say um, anybody who says so, they must actually show the, the transaction that they're talking about. Mm. I, I've never really been involved in any 10% uh, deal anywhere. Uh, in fact, when I worked uh, in Gwazul Natal, I was uh, actually, the reputation was uh, mm. you understand? because of how strict we were. Mm. We started a whole program there to deal with the issues of people who were corrupt and so on and the the uh, problems that happened on through computers and so on. Uh, we had to uh, take a program to make people acknowledge that they have to take responsibility. You can't say I walked away and somebody did a transaction transaction in my in my uh, my computer. But as a treasurer general, everybody knows. I was very clear that uh, the the donations are non-transactional. We don't want any. Uh, we don't want money if it's got conditions. And we will actually be the first ones to report if we think there's corruption on any on any situation. So I think. Does the source of the money, though, well, for example, <coughs> if I were to donate, does the source of the money matter, or did it at that point? Um, uh, if we can get uh, to know what you do as a business, we uh, we would obviously uh, understand where the source of money is. It wasn't quite frequent that we would get money. We don't know where it came from. So we always wanted to know. And, t and, I, and I raise that question, sorry to interrupt, sure. because uh, Edwin Sodi, for example, was a regular donor to the ANC. Yes, exactly. Later, it came out that he had done a transaction with the Free State, which was deemed to be, um, I'll use the word corrupt, but the awarding of that contract uh, procedure, proper procedure had not been followed. So let's just call it irregularly awarded. Yes. And a large portion of that money ended up being donated to the ANC. Yes, but uh, Edwin Sodi was uh, running a construction company. And certainly when the matter, when the donations were given to us, it was given on the basis that uh, Edwin Sodi had actually been involved in a construction company. So we would, I would generally meet people who were donating. Uh, you know, it was, I don't recall instances where people donated money and we didn't know where it came from. We would never accept it like that. So uh, the question of the 10%, I think is just mischievous. Mm. It's mischievous, it's a lie, and actually uh, our challenge, whoever, next time you hear it, you must say to them, they must give you the transaction that they are referring to. Mm. There was certainly, there was never a 10% uh, name that uh, I had never known of it uh, when I was in Guazul Natal, and as our Treasurer General, there was never such a, a, a situation, and as you were talking about issues of corruption, you will notice <clears throat> that uh, the issue of uh, Mr. Sodi came around because he donated the money, but I actually have a, a letter that I wrote to him to thank him for the money. Uh, and so there was no other, uh, you know, 
uh, and no other uh, allegation that involved uh, the Treasurer General of the ANC, despite the huge amount of money we were to raise. <clears throat> so you can be a Treasurer General, you can be a, uh, a minister, and there will be no corruption that is associated with you. But when people make allegations, uh, I think they were just taking liberties in this case. So I would reject this thing with the contempt it deserved, the 10% uh, allegation. Mm. There's an NEC meeting uh, currently scheduled for Friday. Uh, whether or not it will end up happening, I don't know. <coughs> Things are changing at a very rapid pace these days. Uh, in that NEC meeting, there's expectations, for example, that some reports from the NEC Ethics Committee may get tabled. Uh, and for me, even as we speak, there's also an issue that's hanging over the president's head also regarding money in Palapala, right? Uh, there's a report... Uh, that was uh, recently submitted. I think it was ready last week, Wednesday, if not mistaken. The ANC has taken the decision as the NEC that you will vote not to adopt that report. When we come back, I want to find out why the ANC would want to do something like that. Uh, and is it not an abuse of the majority you enjoy in Parliament? Because as you said... You see, when we send MPs to Parliament, we are hoping that they will be representatives of us as individuals and as citizens. If they then clam up as a group, uh, that's not necessarily a member of Parliament. It is now a cabal. Sure. Uh, we join in the studio by Dr. Zulim Kize. Uh, he's going to be with us for at least the next 45 minutes. So if you've got any questions, please let us know. 086-00-00959. Uh, and before we went to the ad break, and the traffic. We're speaking about the NEC. Uh, the meeting is coming up on Friday. And then, of course, the parliamentary sitting uh, that is next week regarding uh, Palapala, amongst other things. So the NEC currently runs on the concept of uh, democratic centralism, which is actually unconstitutional because there was even uh, a constitutional ruling that as a member of parliament, you should actually vote with your conscience as opposed to being told by the NEC what the vote should be. Maybe let's start there. Uh, why do you do that as a party? Well, let's first understand what democratic centralism is supposed to be. Mm. You have a committee or you have a, a, a meeting where all the members of the organization are uh, expected to express their views, debate the issue, differ, and move towards getting a solution. And in the process, they persuade each other. They get to a point where they can those who are opposed begin to see the matter differently and they believe that this matter, the, the, the proposal they had is not necessarily the best solution and then they ultimately accept the reasoning of those who had a different view and by the time we get to the end there is now a kind of general understanding and agreement that this is how this matter needs to be concluded. So when you move out of that meeting you have actually exhausted all the angles we have discussed everything so you you tend to have this is how we're going to move forward it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, <clears throat> people didn't have different views but it means now we've agreed on an approach and once you take that matter out the democratic centralism basically means that we will then use that as approach as we move forward uh, based on this agreement but everybody's views is now considered in this discussion so it helps to manage big organizations. It helps to manage diverse views. It helps to manage uh, to a point where you will then say, you know, uh, we've synthesized with every input, uh, you know, a way forward. <clears throat> but um, the challenge uh, in the last NEC meeting was that uh, the announcement that got made uh, did not really follow that kind of process. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I was in that meeting. Uh, a number of people who still wanted to express themselves and raise issues and uh, influence the direction of the meeting and the conclusion uh, were cut out. And so I find that this last meeting uh, really does not comply with that kind of uh, uh, you know point that you are raising of uh, you know a binding decision a, a democratic centralism because you know 
we normally would say once everybody's views have been expressed, now this is the way forward. But when people have actually been stopped from expressing themselves, then it's a problem. And this I've raised and I objected to the meeting being closed. I know my way because there are many people who had actually not spoken. And uh, for example, uh, one of the minister, Minister Pando, was saying, I'm not leaving before I have a chance to speak. And we went to say, but why to close the meeting? It's still early. They say, you know, they, this would have taken probably another 45 minutes or so and so on and so on. So so this meeting has got that problem. But having said so, uh, let me then say the approach to the members of parliament is again supposed to be, we've discussed this matter, <clears throat> all the views have been expressed, all the angles have been expressed, then you engage the members of parliament. You need to respect them on the basis that they are actually individual public representatives whose discretion, whose uh, you know, uh, 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 decision making is actually a part of a parliamentary process. Then they would discuss the matter, and once they are done with the discussion, they would say, well, we believe that the the resolution of the house structure gives us good enough direction to go forward, and therefore that's what we take. But they might raise concern, and then the matter might need to be t- taken back to say, no, 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 there are things that have not been considered. Like we had uh, when we were talking about the um, termination of uh, pregnancy. Everybody... Uh, was involved and was uh, engaged and then uh, the leadership had taken a view but then uh, mem- parliamentarians raised issues and there were to a reconsideration of how the matter should be approached. So when you deal with the parliamentarians you have to balance the fact that they need to be fully informed of what the political structure would have decided but they must also be fully engaged so that their views as also representing uh, community they must also be infused in this process. Now going into this um, um, meeting I-, I consider that uh, the, that process, uh, you, you know, should have been followed uh, properly, and it has not been really followed pro- 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 properly. Uh, you, you, you cannot manage this matter in a way that suggests that there's a disrespect of under or undermining of public representatives because that devalues parliament as such. So, um, the discussion that we had. For me, uh, I still want to raise it in the next meeting because I think the meeting was not properly handled, not properly uh, you know, concluded. But this is not the first time something like this has happened. For example, if you go back even to a previous administration, there were certain instances, in fact, many of them, where opposition parties would have raised a motion and the ANC would close ranks in parliament uh, to protect the party as a whole and its leadership. I bring this up just as a matter of principle because if we are to say the digital vibes matter was dealt with in Parliament and you were cleared, then we need to have transparency into how these matters are dealt with in Parliament. We also don't know what happens at NEC meetings. All we get told is what the SG comes out and says after a meeting has happened. But the, whether or not the vociferous discussion has taken place, we are none the wiser. Well, look, the closing of ranks is more about us agreeing, all of us, that this is the way to go about it. And therefore, we think that the position a particular leader is taken is actually uh, in keeping with the principles and poli- of the organizations and the policies of the organization. And therefore, we, we identify with that. So when you call it closing ranks, it basically means we've discussed it and we believe it's a correct approach. Now, uh, parliament is supposed to be a transparent Uh, institution. And actually the ANC is uh, supposed to be uh, as a ruling party there the main uh, protector or defender of parliamentary processes. And the ANC should be uh, the champion of constitutionalism, of uh, you know, rule of law, of accountability, of uh, you know, fair processes. Uh, And in this case, uh, the parliament uh, had been criticized before for the way that they handled a number of uh, uh, instances. So the Constitutional Court, for example, uh, uh, rebuked Parliament for not holding the leaders into account. Um, the Zondo Commission also uh, raised the question of, uh, uh, you know, how do we implement uh, the um, uh, uh, party uh, line uh, without considering that those members of Parliament have to be, uh, they have to take a view based on how they understand the matters. Now, that needs to be respected. But in addition, Judge uh, Jafta uh, made a ruling that, look, 
parliament, because it's politics, you can get parties throwing a uh, hundred uh, motions of no confidence against the president. So they, then it was, it was recommended that there must be a process to eliminate those uh, motions of no confidence so that you don't have to spend time on frivolous motions. And once you've got that, you must then have a process that clears it so that it's, you, you decide early whether you need it or you don't need it. And in this case, the process was uh, designed which allowed a panel of a very eminent jurist to uh, uh, assess the issues the allegations that were raised against the president. And then beyond that point, uh, if there was certainly an issue, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, a case to be answered, then of course the president then is given an opportunity to submit the evidence uh, to deal with the matter. Now, where I sit, I actually don't understand what is the problem with that because uh, from, uh, you know, the point of the parliamentary process, the speaker made the call that this is the process that's going to be followed. Now, the ANC as the ruling party uh, actually wa is part of that process. Now, to get that process to move on, to me, it's about saying if there are allegations, like in this case, are very serious, uh, those allegations we must allow the president to actually get them to be cleared. And the president has said, I'm innocent out of all of this. And there is no reason we must doubt that and therefore some people have said this the report is weak and some of that the, the report is flawed and like i've been demonstrating if it's flawed if it, the report is weak it may be easier to even dismiss it you bring the proper evidence so i believe that process there's nothing wrong with it and so I, it needs to actually be allowed to move on that's why i still have to raise the issue within the african national congress national executive committee because i think uh, you know there is nothing procedure a little wrong with moving from that spot uh, that, that that step to the next step as it were now with that uh, in mind i also think that we must uh, always understand that the people that were selected to into the panel are very you know senior juries with impeccable cred uh, credentials uh, you know uh, judge uh, gobo uh, is a former uh, chief justice uh, were it not because of the age and so on, uh, you know, uh, he would have actually, or the time, the time he had served, he, yeah. he would have continued. All right, and, and to prove that, he's actually a, a judge of the Supreme Court in Namibia, and he's a visiting lecturer, a lecturer in law, in constitutional law, in the U.S. for six universities: Harvard, mm -hmm. Cornell, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, and since his youth, he was known as a brilliant uh, legal student, as it were. So I'm saying uh, you, we can't cast aspersions to the process or the participants simply because of our disagreement with the outcome. Welcome back to Kaya Drive, third hour of the show. Still joined in studio by Dr. Zuelim Kize. Uh, got a tweet from Noel Sando Duma saying, come on, please allow us to ask him questions. <laughs> you are allowed, ma'am. You can give us a call right now. 086-00-00959. Or you can just send us a voice note on 63 I'm not going to waste any time with music. We've only got 50 minutes left. So let's get back into this issue of um, ethics within the leadership. So in the NEC meeting that's coming up on Friday, it is expected that because there's an ethics committee there as well, uh, all of the people that have been nominated going towards the conference will have to answer to an ethics committee. Um, you mentioned that your matter pertaining to digital vibes, for example, has received clearance from parliament. But at the ethics committee, I'm not sure if that has been vetted. Uh, what's the status there? Well, <clears throat> the ethics committee had released a report uh, last year. Hmm. And that uh, on the basis of the matter relating to my son and uh, the money paid to the um, ha uh, repair of the house lights, mm. uh, then they felt that that matter would have uh, caused a, a bad image of the organization and that I should then be suspended. Mm. Now, that matter has been cleared by Parliament. Uh, we had uh, a process within the uh, uh, NEC that there should be an appeal made uh, to deal with um, you know, a report that comes from the uh, Integrity Commission. Uh, in this case, uh, I actually submitted the appeal in December last year, around 17th of December. 
<clears throat> and I haven't really uh, had much of that process because I raised it again uh, around the 3rd or 4th of July in an NEC meeting that that uh, matter had in fact been sent for um, for appeal but it had not uh, I had not had uh, any response from that I subsequently wrote to uh, uh, Comrade Mashatile to say to him look here is this um, appeal uh, it has also not been um, uh, you know, acted upon. <clears throat> so now, in the last uh, normal NEC, I raised the issue because the uh, the, the uh, TG uh, at, uh, Co uh, Co Comrade Mashatile came to say to me that uh, he wanted to try and get a team to deal with it. But there's a, a fault in the process because there was a an appeal committee that should have been set that was set up. But uh, its terms of reference have really not been uh, adopted yet. So it's a, a process that really got stuck. I think everything there is in limbo. But nevertheless, the um, uh, elections, uh, the nomina the, ele the elections committee has actually given uh, the list uh, of people who have been nominated, having gone through those uh, situations. They would have considered everything that needed to have been considered there, and then. Um, uh, they released the names uh, at that point. So uh, I don't uh, know there's anything new that would have arisen since then uh, that would have necessitated that they must revise the list. So I would be wait waiting to hear what is there that's being discussed uh, because I'm aware, I'm aware that there's nothing new uh, insofar as that name, uh, my name is concerned. But I, I don't know what the process is going to be that, uh, that we're discussing for, for Friday. So ANC's own step-aside rule uh, dictates that if there is anything uh, that a member is answerable for, then they should not contest power. Uh, we're hearing that branches are saying that they're going to repeal that, for example. Once conference starts, we'll have to see what happens. But of course, it's entirely up to them because you all will be convening there. And I suppose it will be the ANC's decision to take at that point. But what, what I'd want to ask is, does the party not worry itself then if it would seem that every member or at least majority of them in great leadership positions all have a cloud hanging over their head. You'd even ask yourself, couldn't they nominate anybody else who didn't have a cloud hanging over their head? And does it not speak, for example, to the rot in the ANC that everybody uh, at least has something to answer for? There, there are two things I think <clears throat> we must consider when we deal with that question. Firstly, that... Uh, uh, the ANC as a party uh, is opposed to corruption. <clears throat> we have uh, resolutions that we must stamp it out. So there is never going to be anyone who does any form of corruption with the blessing of the party. And I think it needs to be understood who the ANC is. Is those ordinary members of uh, you know society who are you know are members of the ANC. But society as as a whole, uh, you know, uh, you know, does not want to see corruption thriving. So we must all accept that that's the position that we must all take to fight corruption. And in this case, uh, the ANC has embarked on that kind of program. Now, there there are procedures that, that investigations have to be followed so that everybody must subject themselves to any investigative process if they are accused of corruption. Now, that there may be accusations that come about because there is corruption, but that will only be found when the processes prove that there is corruption and therefore action is being taken on the individuals. On the other hand, <clears throat> there, there may be allegations which may be unfounded and therefore the process will also have to prove that that is the situation. I think it's enough for us to say that, uh, you know, uh, personally, I would be... Uh, uh, bold enough to say I will fight corruption wherever it arises but I know that the ANC has taken such a stand. Now the fact that uh, <clears throat> we have found a number of members being involved I think we must subject people to that kind of process. The ANC processes and disciplinary uh, processes does allow uh, for people to be uh, um, disciplined for, for, for corruption and in this case uh, the uh, there would be a need for individuals as well to take responsibility uh, and say if there is a particular problem, then they may actually have to take their own decision as to how to act uh, to protect the image of the organization. Now, 
in my case, <clears throat> uh, I actually resigned, resigned from the executive. As much as I have actually said I was not uh, uh, guilty of any wrongdoing, I did resign and it helped to, to uh, deal with the matter and uh, all the process have been gone through in this case. So I think everybody should be prepared for, for, for that. But in terms of the members having to, um, you know, nominate people there are certain levels of perceptions uh, if somebody is certainly charged and been you know convicted and so on it's very easy for uh, members to be able to say that this one has actually been convicted of it but where there are allegations that still need to be proven i think we need to keep that understanding that the allegations have to be they have to take a particular course of of investigation as it were so th when we go into the um um, conference members are taking all of these issues into account uh, you know allegations the investigative processes uh, the image of the organization the performance of the individual the need they have for a uh, particular uh, skills in the in the organization and take all of that and then take the uh, the nomination from that point of view so i would say therefore it does become a complex matter when you get to the conference as to how you get uh, elections of individuals but allegations uh, need to be, uh, you know, probed properly, and uh, and we must all subject ourselves in that situation. And I think if someone says uh, I'm innocent, they must actually be taken through the process, and they can prove they are innocent, and then we move on. Mm. Mm. We've got some voice notes. Uh, you can put in your earphones just to be able to hear what it is that people are asking, uh, and then we'll be taking some calls as well. Uh, I just want to ask Uti, does he think he's firing or, or, or his resignation or forced to, to resign from his portfolio or was it to maybe Ugumenda Amanda Uti Anga Anga Kajong Monga Meli or Vele Ubonga Tibek Fanel Uti Ayegedi Suskundin Sak? I'll take another one. My question to Upak Zulim Kize, Dr. Zulim Kize, is as a youth, what can he do or say to convince us uh, to vote for his party in the coming elections? Yeah, because I manage a critique. So the NC Youth League has come out in support of you, Kavazela. Um, <laughs> and then, as he correctly points out, I mean, you mentioned unemployment in the country. Once you factor it and just speak about youth unemployment, it goes north of 50%. Uh, unacceptable by any measure and any standard, I'm sure you can agree. So maybe you can start off by answering that second question first. Uh, if you were to be elected, what is it that you would do for our economy and our country? You know, the issue of youth unemployment and the support we have to give to the youth is a very, very important issue. Uh, there cannot be a country that can move, look at uh, the future without investing properly to the youth. I think that the youth need to be given lots of skills, lots of education to be supported, to be mentored, so that they can actually build their own livelihood through uh, the skills they have, through the support they can get. And I think that it's important for even the education system to be structured such that it allows young people to get into education and also begin to know how they can actually run a, a successful, you know, income generating uh, program on their own, even, you know, even if they don't have degrees, the artisanal skills and all of that is, becomes important. Now, um, uh, the level of unemployment requires a huge complex prog program to address. I would say to start off with, uh, we need uh, to focus on uh, expanding the economy, growing the economy, because when you get a problem when there's not enough opportunity to get employment, I believe that it's important to even focus on uh, each sector and get a pact with government and private sector to say how do we create jobs in each sector with government supporting and private sector also initiating? And then we must hold the private sector accountable for the jobs that they initially wanted to create and what over the period they are able to, to, to do with the support of government. The uh, infrastructure built is a huge issue that uh, in 2010 helped us to, uh, you know, 
improve the economy and create jobs uh, through construction. And I think we need to bring that very much close into the situation. We also need to focus on uh, bringing factories and industries closer to the villages and townships so that people don't have all to uh, take a taxi to town, but they can have employment opportunities nearby where they are. Now, the young people, we need a bank that must be able to focus on the low end market people who are unemployed people who have got low, low income uh, people who are small who are small business people who are in cooperatives supported by the reserve bank supported by government so that this bank must actually help those who have got initiatives who have got ideas of how they can create jobs young people are very uh, very uh, innovative especially with this ICT uh, situation young people can do that but not only that you can get people can do very simple jobs you know uh, 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 many years ago when I was working uh, as a premier in Gosling Natal, we actually trained youngsters, uh, youth uh, for employment and we charged the training on the basis of the absorption of the students uh, of the students after qualification. One of the calls that was very important that, that, that was very successful was car wash. So in 18 months when we tracked, we found that one of the students had actually, one of those young people had actually created this car wash which was employing 22 people. Where would they have been employed if they had actually not been a very entrepreneurial young man? So there are lots of opportunities which we can actually use a supporting system for young people. You don't have to go and be, you know, a employed by a big company, but you can do certain things. But we also need to hold their big business uh, accountable. Now, if somebody is making trains, manufacturing trains, because I got involved in this discussion, and I said, if you want to do nails or rivets, you know, this thing that puts mm. in one uh, you know, a metal sheet to the other, those things are not sophisticated. You can buy small machines that you can put in the villages and township and get youngsters to actually manufacture the rivets. And then the totaling number of them who are running small factories, but then, uh, you know, all of this can actually go and supply a big business. Then they are located in, in center of town, but actually they are sub, uh, supplied by small uh, you know, contractors in the in the townships. Now, I think there's a lot of that that we can do for young people, educations and skills, and every uh, district. Simple things, you know, uh, even artisanal things uh, uh, where people, uh, you know, even cobbler. You, you, somebody's got a problem with a shoe, somebody can mend it. You know, sewing, somebody can do a suit. You know, for you, it's it's a business and so on. But you also also have huge high end businesses where. Black business must be supported to get into those high level, uh, you know, industrial, uh, you know, operations that are possible. So we need to focus a lot on that. And I want to say we need to actually structure this on a district to district basis, commit government and private sector, local municipalities, what are you going to buy from young people? What are you going to buy from small businesses? And then monitor on a continuous basis so that everywhere when we say there are going to be jobs created, every sector must tell us where they're going to the, the jobs, how many, and which district, and how many in this district, and monitor it. And young people must be mobilized at that level. So I think there's a lot that we need to do. Mm. When we come back, I want to speak about that, uh, that last point, about doing business with government. Uh, how practical is it? How many people actually have the access that's required in order to be able to render and offer their services to government institutions? And then, of course, the issue of capital. You spoke about banks. I want us to delve deeper into that. Uh, still joined by Dr. Zulim Kize in the studio for the next 25 minutes. You can give us a call if you've got any questions. 86 959 Good afternoon, team. Good afternoon, uh, Kabazela, Dr. Um, my question is, pertaining the known issue of people robbing tenders, particularly in KZN, there are forums. Now they are becoming formal but they are literally robbing tenders and they are affecting service delivery because they stop everything unless you give them cash that they demand. That is known, but these groups are seemingly growing in support and in getting response because they are getting what they want. What would you do as a president to make sure that the country is runnable and with the rule of law? intervening in such issues 
Let's take another voice note. Hello, Sizo and our team. Sizo, I came in a village called Begasdorp outside Zanin. There is two villages there. There is Kavaza and Begasdorp. At this place, since 1999, we never had water, even today. The only, there is trucks that are delivering water, but those trucks are selling water. And those people who are selling water there, they are connected to the ANC. They are selling water to a, a Jojo tank. They charge 350. And those villages, those two villages, there they are poor villages. And then what I want to say is this. The ANC only serve its people, only serve those people who are connected to the ANC. Last time we had the meeting, when we raised these issues, those people there, they said to us, the people who need water, they must have bowls. Some of us, we, don't, we can't even afford those poles. What I'm saying is, ANC doesn't have the interest of the people at that. They only have the interest of themselves at that. Okay. Uh, so maybe let's go with the first voice notes where they were speaking about tenders. Um, you were speaking about how young people should be given opportunities to work with government, should be given funding. The term tenderpreneur, for example, uh, has been made to seem like a very negative thing because the idea of even doing business with government because of the corruption and the rampant corruption is always seen as dishonest uh, way of business. I think the concern people have had are instances where, you know, there are people who do nothing but they use their connection to those in authority to access contracts and that's the issue that we've been talking about and that is something that we must be very strongly uh, against uh, so that uh, we must stamp it out but it is not going to be possible to say government will perform all the services so there will be services that will require someone from outside government to do what we need is to be very strong in monitoring and ensuring that uh, these uh, are done procedurally correctly and that it's not as just you know young black um, business people who get tenders. They're huge business, huge companies that are actually serving servicing government. And many of them are actually run by white people. So when you deal with this issue, you need to understand that there are needs for government to get a business to, partic to participate in uh, rendering services, whereas government is the one that actually offers the biggest contracts right across, whether it's construction and everything. So uh, we need to just understand that. But what people are actually saying, let's not have corruption in the way people re receive those contracts. And that's what we must fight. And I think it's important to make that distinction. Now, having said so, the caller raises the problem of uh, um, the what they what you call the uh, people are robbing tenders. It's a, it's a new thing that's a tendon, uh, the, the tendons that has just come up. It was never there before. And um, I think there are two things that I think are probably seemingly linked to it. Part of it has got to do with people who are taking advantage of the fact that they can cause uh, they can cause uh, disruption and get away with it, uh, and so maybe they feel that uh, police aren't very strong in dealing with this matter. The other one are people who uh, you know uh, feel that there is corruption all along, so they are justifying doing those kinds of things. It's wrong. It's wrong. It doesn't matter what the explanation. But my point would be. Uh, immediately, you know, uh, we have to deal with this. The ANC, government, and all the parties must actually focus on it. One, I think that we need to be very clear how you allow people to be participating in the uh, contra in the contracts, in the construction, how you can uh, engage, involve, and uh, incorporate people who are, you know, uh, emerging contractors, so that it is clear how that is done. Then you bring in the police, bring in the associations that are also, that are involved, and bring everybody together so that they can monitor, they can report, and then there must be a response. And I think that it can be done. This thing doesn't need to take take a long time. It can actually be done within within the end of a year, you could actually have all of this. And then, of course, engage people, because some of the people can justify and say there's a reason why this is the case. They must be convinced that it's not so, but then how do you go about it Going to get to, to to be involved in the in business, but also nothing happens without capital, right? And, and very often uh, we speak about the need for a government bank, but because of the trust deficit, people are even reluctant to allow that to happen. Uh, we saw it happen with VBS, for example. Uh, wherever there is money involved, uh, the general public in South Africa is just reluctant to give government full unvetted access to such money. 
I think if you deal, if you're talking about a bank, the bank has run like a bank in this in the form of uh, you know uh, proper financial administration and proper uh, you know uh, um, uh, good governance and uh, uh, fighting against corruption. It needs to be primarily about that. But uh, it's also important to say uh, there is a need for such a bank, and then. Because we are talking about low and low income uh, groups, they will not necessarily on their own uh, be able to deal with uh, with that. But just give you an example: there are lots of uh, uh, you know grants that come from government. Now, some of those grants don't necessarily need to come as grants. They can actually come as some form of low interest loans that can actually u- be used by young people, by women, by you know small businesses. Uh, but as long as the administration is properly you know, uh, done. I think that becomes a, you know, a, a, an important issue there. Bukuletu. Siswe. Unjan. I am well, thank you. Uh, so, what's happening in the world of business? Today, we've just been concentrating in the world of Ooh, politics. I see that. I see <laughs> that. I, I must just say, I've been listening into the conversation, so I must say it's uh, it's great to hear some of the insights that you've been sharing, uh, Kabazela. So, really appreciate it. And maybe I'll, I'll pick your brain on a few themes there. Okay. But I have a quick question to squeeze in, because everyone oh, else course. is saying that they ahead. don't have a question. Go ahead. Deputy Minister. Oh, gosh. Now I'm saying Deputy Minister. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> That's the promotion. Oh, I could be saying something else, right? That might lead to to the presidency. But I I appreciate all the insight that you've shared around the economy. We've been listening very tentatively as um, um, oh, audience you. members. But what I'm really intrigued about, um, and see as we touched on it earlier, this trust deficit that we often see between the private sector and the public sector, it's always heightened, especially during times like uh, these, where there's um, a tumultuous news flow that's influencing the markets. And I'm keen to understand. If you have any learnings that you can share during your time as the health minister in South Africa, naturally what we saw was that there was a heightened level of camaraderie, companionship and trust that actually uh, took place between members of the private sector as well as government. Are there lessons and learnings that you think we can unlock from that experience to propel South Africa into an ongoing uh, economy that actually sees positive growth outcomes? No, a very interesting question, you know, Kukulit, because as a matter of fact, there is no way South Africa can grow, South Africa's economy can grow, unless there is cooperation between public and private sector. Mm-hmm. And whatever people say about the African National Congress, there is no leader of the ANC that will sit here, sit here and say, we can never work with business. It is un. You know, unimaginable. And so sometimes the stories that go out there about well, there's going to be this group, that faction, this and that and that, is a figment of imagination. The reality is that we have to deal with the issue of inequality in this country. But the basis of it is that you need a partnership. You know, when there was a problem in uh, Japan after the tsunami, <clears throat> somebody came back was telling the story. The Prime Minister came in, called business and said, guys, we have a problem, we need to rebuild. One, two, three is what needs to be done. What do we need in South Africa? Uh, what I would do, I would call the different sector say well, let's come in here mm-hmm. this sector let's talk about car manufacturing i've been engaged with them with them quite a bit when i was treasurer general what's your target where you want to go what do you need from government now how many jobs can you create now the market that you need from outside government needs to help to create because of the bilateral relationships east west and everywhere that's why we have to deal with the rest of the world and everywhere not just be on only deal with one part of the world mm-hmm. and for every sector we can actually have a target jobs to be created growth that we need and out of that we monitor it then break it down where is, where are all these located district by district and then we can actually have this Pact, this pact, this social combat, that at the end of the year we're all counting. Did you get the jobs you wanted? Who went? What went wrong? Mm-hmm. Simple things. Getting to give a municipal license for the thing to be done, rezoning, and so on. A lot of that can be done. Good governance is what will give you that. So I'm saying I've been through that kind of space where with uh, what we call the growth coalition in Guazulu Natal, we would sit here and then go to the department that is slowing down the uh, investment opportunities mm. and look at L, the district and where do we need to uh, you know, distribute your investors all over so that everybody must feel they're giving attention. For me, it's a fascinating opportunity to actually grow the economy and keep this partnership because there's no way Business belongs here. Government will be here. Poverty must be reduced. Inequality must be reduced. There must be space for increasing new participants. Then you'll stop all of this thing of people who think they can hijack their way into a construction thing when they don't have the skills. That, for me, is what we need to do. 
Welcome back to Car Drive, about to wrap up the third hour of the show. Still joined in studio by Dr. Zuelim Kiza. If you've got any questions, give us a shout. 086-00-0959. Peggy in Johannesburg. Good afternoon, Mr. Domo. How are you, sir? We well. Thank you very much. What's your question? Thank you, man. Um, Dr. Zuelim Kiza, sir. Um, we long overdue for a female leader as a president in our country. In your view... As men been changing themselves and but not giving an opportunity to be a female leader, uh, I want to ask you, sir, if it is in your uh, interest at the moment. And if ANC decided to choose for a female leader just to change the grounds and probably looking at female in our country that are capable, which female uh, leader that you will probably suggest that the ANC can choose to be? Uh, our next president. I'm coming for that and I'm praying every day that one day we find a woman as the president in our country. Thank you very much for that, Peggy. Kawazel, uh, let's take maybe another question and then you can answer both of them. Tiaboko in West Rand. Thank you, Sizwe. I just wanted to, uh, to ask the doctor, um, what are the chances of South Africa changing the economic system? Because seemingly this capitalist, uh, capitalism is not working for us. And I've checked in Africa, uh, we don't have any country that has successfully achieved the economic uh, activity uh, under the, this movement, this, this uh, uh, capitalism. Uh, and we checked that even the parasitas, the way they were formed, I think more of socialism was used and they were able to actually deal with unemployment. But now employing this capitalism system is, is killing us because it, it benefits the minority. So I just wanted to check, uh, can, can it be that uh, the ANC can think about uh, moving to, towards socialism? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kawazela, maybe just to answer those, you've got about two minutes, so maybe a minute on each. Okay. Look, we, the ANC believes in what we call a mixed economy, where private sector will play a role and the uh, public sector, the government, will play a role, but other forms such as uh, uh, social ownership, uh, cooperatives, I still believe that there's a lot of room for us to mobilize our um, people around those three forms of ownership and management of the economy. That is what I would like us to focus on, and uh, there is still space for parasitas to be controlled by government and to create jobs and also to manage some of the services which are important for this, for society. The other, there are a couple of other questions here, but let me just deal with the issue of the female leader. Uh, certainly, uh, I believe that uh, South Africa has got a lot of uh, capable women leaders, and uh, of all of them, uh, we must say that it's going to be. In the ANC, there's nothing that stops any leader, female leader, from being elected. Then at the end, it's going to be up to the delegates the, in the conference uh, or the voters in the uh, national elections to decide whether they want to give support to this or that particular individual. But I don't see that there should be any restriction for anybody because uh, of uh, being female. Then the one other point that was raised, uh, I can just say in relation to the question of uh, have I been suspicious of anything, I've actually accused the, uh, you know, on the issue of digital vibes, uh, the investigation needed to be done and I've raised all the issues there. The only question that I've raised is why did the SIU decide to fabricate a report and, uh, based on uh, falsity? And I've asked them, was there any influence about it behind the scenes? And the question for me is that I have seen that there are certain things that happened here, uh, you know, where p- people interfere in the um, uh, criminal justice system. So that's why I've challenged it to say, let's come out, let's be clear what's happening. I think lastly, having said so, I must say that uh, the ANC conference must be about bread and butter issues, fuel prices that are up, food prices that are up. It must be about crime, you know, theft and car hijacks. It must be about drugs. It must be about, you know, gender-based violence. It must be about, you know, poverty, unemployment youth distress all of these are the issues that must be part of the ANC day-to-day life and occupation as well as the conference and on that basis I want to say to the young people we as Zuelim Kize I would want to stand up there and say I'm the champion of the improvement of the life of the young people and their development and when I depart I must be able to look back and see how many young people have been mentored and helped so that they can actually take over this land and run as owners of this land 
Thank you very much. Uh, that is all the time that we have for this interview this afternoon. Dr. Zulim Kize, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And you if you missed out on anything, we'll have this available on podcast on YouTube. Uh, there will be a video as well. Thank you for your calls. Thank you for your texts. Thank you for your messages. We'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place. But for now, stick around for Car Biz coming up after this.